All right. Thank you so much for joining us today, Patrick. I really appreciate it. Sure. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Rebecca. Uh, absolutely. And uh, a, a lot of what we are going to talk today, I just kind of want to level set for parents. So uh, the expectation is focused more on proper breathing and things, ways that we can help children that have breathing issues to help them with some of the other elements, like the mental aspects of it, anxiety, things like that. There's a number of fronts to it. You know, interestingly today, I went in on PubMed, which is accessible to all parents. Okay. I put in mouth breathing and malocclusion and it brought up something like 749 papers. I spent a half an hour to an hour going through just randomly selecting papers. Mm -hmm. And looking at the connection that mouth breathing and malocclusion, so uh, crooked teeth, for example, Mm -hmm. the connection is really, really common. Now, does it necessarily show that there's cause and effect, but the connection is there all the same. Mm -hmm. And this has been debated since 1909 and probably even before that. In dentistry, I remember reading an article that was published in the journal Cosmic, um, Co Cosmic Dentistry, and it was by an author called De, De John. And they were talking about the effects of mouth breathing and the child was inattentive in school. The child's face was dull and expressionless. Mm -hmm. The teacher was accusing the child of not paying attention. And then I asked the question, we haven't moved on in over 100 years. How come has right. this been forgotten about? And I have my own personal journey. I got into breathing because of my own issues. Most people who work in this field fell into the field of breathing primarily because of dealing with their own issues. And as a kid, I was very frustrated in school. And I was frustrated in school because we're required to sit there and to absorb information and to be attentive to what the teacher is saying, mm -hmm. but we don't have the energy levels to back it up. We're sitting there with brain fog. We're sitting there with fatigue because of, in very often, a sleep disorder. And I had that sleep disorder. So at 14 years of age, I left school never to go back to school. And this was back in the 1980s. And I'd say people are sometimes shocked when they hear that. I wrote about it first in the book, Atomic Focus, which was published last year. So okay. it's not something that you go and tell everybody about, you know. But right. I left school out of a total sense of frustration that there was no point in me being there if I wasn't picking up on what the teacher was saying. Hmm. And yet in junior school, I was very up at the top of the class. Now, it turned out that I did go back to school one year later and I studied hard and I got my grades and I got into university and it could have been a lot easier. So we as a society, we're labeling children as whether they are intelligent or not based on their academic achievement. Mm -hmm. But in order to excel academically, you need to be able to focus and concentrate. Right. Focus is narrowing your attention to one thing. So deciding what are you actually going to place your attention upon. Concentration is the act of holding your attention on that one thing. So you might be reading a particular book. Mm. Are you able to hold your attention on the text as you're reading the book? And your attention span is the length of time that you're able to hold your attention on one thing. Mm -hmm. Now, in order for us to excel, we need to have both focus, concentration, and also attention span. Okay. So the kids in terms of that are being labeled as being intelligent or not, nobody is teaching them how to concentrate. Nobody is talking about attention span. And very few people is talking about the connection with poor sleep. What about these kids? What about the 25 to 50 percent of children who are persistently mouth breathing, mm -hmm. who are snoring, who are stopping breathing during sleep? And these are the three hallmark symptoms mouth breathing, snoring, and apnea. Those children are going to have sleep disruption. They're not going to do as well academically as the children with good breathing. So society right. have forgotten about the kids who have mouth breathing and sleep disorders. It was no different for me back 40 years ago when I was that nine-year-old child or the child that's sitting in the classroom today. But it even goes beyond that. If parents put in into PubMed or put into Google, Karen Bonnock, B-O-N-U-C-K, 
and pediatrics or Karen Bonnock and sleep disorder breathing. Mm-hmm. They'll pull up a paper that she conducted. It was published in the journal Pediatrics in 2012. And she looked at 11,000 British school kids. She looked at children who, were, who had sleep issues at age five, if untreated. Now, a sleep issue is simple snoring. And I don't mean to talk about simple, but most often these kids, it's completely overlooked. Those children with sleep issues at age five, if untreated, they have a 40% increased risk, risk of special education needs by age eight. So she talked about, if, you, if we read that paper, she talked about that the brain is developing during slow wave sleep. And slow wave sleep is deep restorative sleep. Mm-hmm. But if the child is snoring or mouth breathing or stopping breathing, it prevents the child from going into the slow wave sleep mm-hmm. and it's affecting development of the brain. Right. So the children with poor sleep their IQ levels are going to be significantly reduced versus the children with good sleep. And unfortunately, this is being overlooked. So coming back to PubMed today, looking at that connection, how many children have overcrowding of teeth? And when a child is overcrowding of teeth, what's this, what is this telling us? It's telling us not necessarily that the teeth are too big, but the jaws are too small. Mm-hmm. There's not enough right. room for the teeth because the jaws have not developed the way they should have developed. Mm -hmm. And because the jaws are narrower, more V-shaped, there's not enough room for the tongue. The jaws are set back in the face. The tongue is more likely to encroach the airway. The airway is narrower. The child now is going to have disruptions to their breathing during sleep. And what's more, this doesn't just affect the child during childhood. This carries through for the rest of their life. Right. So dentistry has debated this for 100 years, but I would say to any parent, go in on PubMed and put in mouth breathing and malocclusion. Put in sleep disorder breathing and brain development. And put in these keywords and look at the papers that you pull up. Now, today, I could not find one single paper. I'm sure there's a few of them. Out of 700 plus papers, you would expect a few, but I could not find one single paper that did not show that mouth breathing children have changes in the shape of their face. Now, one could argue, well, the child was born with a narrow palate. The child was born with a high palate. This infringed the child's nasal cavity. And as a result, the child had to mouth breathe because the child was feeling that they weren't getting enough air through their nose. Okay, Mm. that's fine to think of it that way. Or one could think that while the child was having their mouth open, especially during those critical growth periods, age one to five years of age, Mm -hmm. it's when the fastest growth spurt takes place. Right. And because the the mouth was open and the child was breathing through, the tongue wasn't able to rest up in the roof of the mouth. And because the tongue resting, the tongue wasn't resting in the roof of the mouth, the jaws didn't develop the way they should do. Now, either way, we have a connection between narrow jaws, longer facial structure, overcrowding of teeth and mouth breathing. Mm-hmm. Whether it's the genetic that the child was born that way or whether it's environmental and the genes coming together. The real issue here is that dentistry, one way or the other, has a role to play. Because the right. dentist is in an ideal position to be able to do something about it, to expand the palate, to bring in myofunctional therapy, to mm-hmm. eliminate oral behaviors such as mouth breathing, tongue sucking, uh, pacifier, overuse of pacifier, eating soft foods, to check tongue tie, to encourage breastfeeding. Because these are all the necessary ha- habits that are important for the correct development and the growth of the face of the child. And it goes... We were talking about academics, but it goes beyond that because when the face grows correctly, the face is good looking. Mm -hmm. Good looking people have it easier in life. You know, it's been shown good looking kids will tend to get better marks. Good looking kids will tend to get away with misdemeanors. And there was a study of individuals put in their photographs were put in front of judges. And the individuals with the less attractive faces were more prone to receiving a harsher penalty from the judge. 
So mm -hmm. we as human beings, unknowingly, we do judge individuals based on looks and probably because it comes down to survival of the species. Right. A good looking sense. face is the face that nature is intended. We select our partners based on looks, partly. Mm -hmm. Partly, and sure. We select it probably because we know that if I select a good, attractive looking woman, her airway is good, her genetic pooling is good. So our face is, it's a very important, I suppose, it's very difficult to, well, in terms of the words and I'm trying to, but our face is, is, it's almost that our face is the first thing that people see. It's and is, as a measure of health. And it comes back full circle. The children with mouth open, it can contribute to abnormal craniofacial development. I know there's debate on it, but I am going to come back to, even if it's a genetic influence and the child was born with the high upper narrow palate, something could be done about it. Right. That's what we need to start recognizing. And I remember reading an article by an orthodontist called Catherine Vig, and she was asking, is there a role for the importance of nose breathing in orthodontics. And she was saying that it's difficult because there's a number of scientific questions that can't be answered. Number one is, at what age, if the child gets a stuffy nose, does it have the biggest impact? Is it when the child is two years of age and causes mouth breathing, or is it six, seven, or eight? Okay, these are the questions she's putting out. Okay. For how long does the child have to breathe through the open mouth before it has a negative impact? How much nasal obstruction is clinically relevant? How do you define mouth breathing? We don't have the answers to these questions, but we have to ask and we have to allow common sense kick in here. If a child is persistently breathing through an open mouth when they are distracted, during sleep, during rest, it points that at least for some of the time, their mouth is open. If they're breathing through, their tongue isn't resting in the roof of the mouth. And that is going to impact craniofacial development, their looks, but also their academic ability, especially when the airway is compromised due to setback of the jaws. And not just looks and intelligence, but mm -hmm. also how they can function. You know, we're starting to see this correlation between ADHD and anxiety and depression, things that you know, in the beginning, none of us even thought there was a connection. But, you know, as you dig into it, yeah, kind of to your point, this, if it's impacting your intelligence, then it is logical to say, obviously, it is impacting their emotions. They, they can't of course, cope. Because we're in an increased stress response and society is mm -hmm. demanding that the child is able to be attentive. And also, there's an awful lot of pressure on kids to get grades. Right. There's pressure by the parents. There's pressure by the teachers. And the child, you know, the child who is not performing so well, their self-esteem is going to be affected. But coming back to ADD and ADHD, in that same paper by Karen Bonnock, mm -hmm. she said there are 3 million children aged between 6 and 21 years of age in the United States, 3 million kids that have issues associated with sleep disorder breathing, including ADD and ADHD. Mm. So can you imagine this is a moral cost? It's an economic cost. It's a societal cost. Of course. And unfortunately, unfortunately, why has it been overlooked? Mm -hmm. Why has the importance of breathing in and out through the nose? Why has the importance, the recognition of correct tongue resting posture as an aid to developing the forward growth of the jaws to help open up the airways so the child grows into an adult with good breathing for the rest of their life. How come it has been overlooked? It's a really pertinent question. It's one that I've been asking myself for about 12, 13 years. Tomorrow morning, I interview Dr. John Mew and Dr. Mike Mew. Okay. John Mew is 94 years of age now, and he's been talking mm -hmm. about nasal breathing, correct tongue resting posture for about 40 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. Mike Mew is a little bit older than me. He's in his early 50s. It's going to be a really interesting conversation. And it's going to be a conversation because what they have been saying, that even though they've been, in essence, pioneers in what they've been saying, 
there has been some kickback from traditional orthodontists. And that is really unfortunate because we have to start asking these questions. And I would say to parents, listen, you go into a restaurant and look at the face of the mouth breathing kid. You will see it. If mouth breathing didn't have an impact on faces, the term adenoid faces would never have come into being. Yeah. So a situation, and it's a medical term, that when the adenoids are enlarged, the child is not going to feel comfortable breathing through the nose because the space at which the nose meets the throat is too narrow, too small. Mm-hmm. Right. The child Thank feels you. air hunger, breathing through the nose, so switches to mouth breathing. When the child switches to mouth breathing, they have to drop the tongue. Adenoid faces are not the change in the face solely because the adenoids are enlarged. Adenoid faces are the change in the shape of the face owing to the mouth breathing pattern as a result of the enlarged adenoids. It's not just enlarged adenoids that cause mouth breathing. It's the mouth breathing that's causing the abnormal impact on the face. Mm-hmm. Go in and Google and put in adenoid faces and just hit images and you will see image after image. We see these kids They could have been beautiful looking kids. They're undergoing orthodontics, 11, 12, 13 years of age. There's often a belief out there that if you straighten teeth, it will make an enormous impact on the child's face. Right. And we're doing retractive orthodontics and we're we're missing, we're we're adding insult to injury. We're taking out teeth and this small airway is is getting smaller because we're not pulling things forward and widening. Yes, a straight teeth do not create a good looking face, but right. a good looking face will create straight teeth. Right. Because if the face has grown the way it should have gone, it has room. It has room for the teeth. And mm-hmm. then you have to ask, well, is this just some minority of kids that are experiencing this? Of course not. You walk into any 11 year old school, you know, classroom. Mm-hmm. And ask how many children here are undergoing orthodontics. And it's probably 60, 70% of these kids. Right. Right. And as parents, we didn't know because it was done to us. We're doing it to our children. So now, you know, yes. we're on the second generational impact of airway. And now you're starting to see our generation. I'm lumping you in with me that you're with my generation. <laughs> that we're starting to see these sudden spikes and high blood pressure and sleep apnea. I mean, how often, how many people do you know that have CPAP? I mean, it's just Mm -hmm. common. It's epidemic. It's epidemic. And Dr. Christian Gimeno, who's considered the founding father of sleep medicine, Mm -hmm. he talked about a few things that are impacting and increasing the risk of sleep apnea or sleep disorder breathing. Two of the genesis is one. So, for example, if the child is missing one or more teeth Mm -hmm. as an adult, and he's saying these are risk factors that could be identified early in life. So he, when he was working in Stanford, sadly, he's passed on. Mm -hmm. A patient might walk into his clinic and the patient may be 40 years of age. The patient is after having sleep apnea for probably 30 of those years. The patient is missing one or two teeth. This could have been identified early on in life. This could have been predicted. Mm -hmm. He also talks about extractions. So for example, extraction of wisdom teeth, that when there's an extraction, it in turn is making the mouth smaller. When the mouth is smaller, there's not enough room for the tongue and the tongue has nowhere to go, but back into the throat. Now, of course, a sleep medicine specialist will say it's not just as simple as that. It's not, sleep apnea is more complex, but these are one of the factors. Right, right, because just to be clear. Of yeah. All of the phenotypes in sleep apnea, there is four in particular in adult sleep apnea. One is anatomical, but it's the single biggest contributory factor to sleep disorder breathing. And that would be PCRIT, is the pharyngeal, pharyngeal closing pressure, the suction pressure at which the airway is collapsing. So it's an anatomical phenotype. There are three others which are non anatomical but they are also influenced by how we breathe, such as upper airway recruitment. 
that's influenced by myofunctional therapy. Loop gain is influenced by your breathing pattern and your chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. Arousal threshold refers to whether you're a light sleeper or a deep sleeper. So for example, if you have insomnia, you have lower arousal threshold. If you're a really, really deep, deep sleeper, you've got a high arousal threshold. We can still influence true breathing because we can show how to downregulate. So an individual who is having insomnia, they're overstimulated. They can't fall asleep readily. Their mind is racing. They're overthinking. Or they may be waking up at two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning. They're lying there for an hour or two. They can't fall back to sleep. How can we help to downregulate? By changing breathing patterns, by slowing down the exhalation, by breathing in and out through the nose. And especially when we have that really slow and soft exhalation, the body is telling the brain that everything is safe. When the brain interprets that the body is safe, we're more likely to go back to sleep. But if we're lying there and we're mouth breathing and fast breathing and hard breathing, the body is telling the brain that the body is not safe and the brain will keep us up. So we have to be careful of the communication that the body is telling the brain. And part of that communication is relayed via the vagus nerve. Okay. 80 to 90% of the communication by the vagus nerve is from the bottom up, from the body up to the brain. And we can tap into that via the breath. So the mouth breathing child, as I was, poor sleep, we're already mm -hmm. in an increased stress response. Right. We can't focus during the day. The adrenaline from sleep has carried through to during the day. We're sitting in class with our mouth open. Mouth breathing is a faster breathing pattern, a shallow breathing pattern. This also is telling the brain that we're in a stress response. So both during wakefulness and also during sleep, how we breathe, our airways, the quality of our sleep is going to influence the balance of the autonomic nervous system. No child is going to reach their full potential if they have sleep disorder breathing. And the three hallmark symptoms of this is snoring, mouth breathing, and apnea. Right. And just to be clear, every time we bring up snoring in kids, I like to mention it's not cute. It's not normal. Um, as a society, we've, we've made it that way, but it's not. So if your child is a chronic snorer, that is yeah. a sign. We should, not, we should not hear breathing of a child during sleep. And also, you know, you might think that, well, an adult having an apnea, it has to last for about 10 seconds or so. For a child, it's only two breaths. And all the child has to have is one apnea every hour to be clinically significant. Now, mm -hmm. the other thing that I would say is any parent who wants to explore this, because the gold standard of treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. Mm -hmm. And in a paper published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, co-authored, but well, the lead author was Batter, Batter Chargy. They looked at 578 children who underwent tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy for sleep disorder breathing. Out of the 578 kids, only 27 of them, 27%, sorry, had their sleep apnea cured post-tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. 73% of these children continue to have residual sleep apnea post T and A. Now, at the top of that paper, you will read that the efficacy of tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy in the treatment of sleep disorder breathing in children is unknown. This was published in 2010. This practice has been carried out with children since the late 1970s. Mm -hmm. How can a practice be carried out? And it's not a walk in the park. Right. Without, without it's the efficacy of it being known. Mm -hmm. Now, in fairness, the AHI, which is a measurement of the sleep apnea severity, it did reduce from 18 events down to four events per hour. But four events per hour is bordering on moderate sleep apnea with children because five is the cutoff point. Mm -hmm. So then we have to ask the question, well, there's something else going on here. Right. There's still no and room. There's no room. Mm -hmm. And we have to be considering retronatia. We have to be considering inflammation. We have to be considering the breathing patterns. And it was Dr. Christian Gimeno again, 
He spoke about the critical importance of restoring nasal breathing during wake and sleep as the only valid and complete correction of pediatric sleep disorder breathing. Restoration of nasal breathing during wakefulness and sleep as the only valid and complete correction of pediatric sleep disorder breathing. We must teach our children to breathe in and out through the nose. And, and, and to that, I mean, I, I would like to take some time to, to demonstrate some things parents can show their children, but I, I don't want to get too far away from it because you mentioned inflammation and carbon dioxide. And from reading your books, and I'll, I'll put the links within the show notes so parents can, can grab them and because they're, they're great references for working with kids, but also our, ourselves. Um, you really stress this part of proper breathing is how we're processing and working with carbon dioxide because we were always taught it was just this waste gas, but it's actually, that's part of proper breathing. Could maybe we talk a little bit about that to help parents understand that? Yeah, you know, as human beings, we, we breathe in to bring in oxygen. And we breathe out the excess CO2, but the key yeah. is don't breathe out too much of it. Right. It's not, it's not about get, getting rid of it all. Not all of you know, it, what, right. What does carbon dioxide do? We must have a certain amount, not too much, not too little, just right. So we're talking about the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, which in turn is influenced by the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the lungs. And the pressure of carbon dioxide in the lungs is influenced by how hard and fast we breathe. So if, for example, I start breathing hard and fast, yeah. I'm going to remove too much carbon dioxide from the lungs as I'm breathing out hard and fast, a lot of volume of air. And with that, I'm getting rid of carbon dioxide from the lungs. This in turn is going to get rid of carbon dioxide in the blood. And this is in turn is going to cause my blood vessels to constrict. It also causes hemoglobin, which is the protein that carries oxygen, to hold on to oxygen more readily. So it's ironic that the harder and the faster we breathe, the more our blood vessels constrict and the less oxygen that's delivered throughout the body. But also the harder and faster breathing, the brain is interpreting that the body is going into fight or flight. Right. So it needs to, you know, in terms of breathing, and if somebody is looking at what's the physiology behind this, just Google the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R. Mm -hmm. So this was discovered back in 1904, that the functions of carbon dioxide are well written in any medical textbook with a section on respiratory physiology. It's the primary regulator of blood pH. It's a vasodilator. It's helping to open up the blood vessels. It's a bronchodilator. It helps to open up the airways. And it also assists in the release of oxygen from the red blood cells to the tissues and organs. You know, so the idea of telling a child if they're stressed to take a big deep breath, well, that may be, in essence, the absolute wrong thing to do. We should be teaching children how to regulate their states. We should be teaching kids who are going in to do exams. And again, it's been documented, children who are going to do exams how does their breathing change? Those children with the most anxiety, their breathing gets faster, harder, upper chest, and irregular. Mm -hmm. And there's a correlation between the change in breathing and anxiety. But the one thing about the breath is that you've got some degree of control over it. So if we had a child who is predisposed to anxiety, mm -hmm. if that child knew that by changing and controlling their breathing pattern, they can help to minimize, to reduce to control their anxiety. It's a great tool. It's not happening, not yet, but I think it will. And, you know, we use breathing techniques. We use them with the military. I use them with police. I use them with top fighters, Olympic athletes. We use them with all walks of life. You know, so breathing is something now that is getting out there because this isn't about taking the deep breath or taking the full breath. This is about knowing how do you breathe when you want to upregulate when you want to downregulate, when you want to improve your sleep quality, when you want to change your state of mind, you know, and really we have to be thinking of it this way, that breathing does need the attention. Now, in terms of children, the breathing exercise for kids are all free. We've put them up there. They're all up on YouTube. If any parent goes into our YouTube channel or even downloads the Buteco Clinic app, which is free, 
all mm -hmm. of the exercise for kids are there. So, you know, we there's different videos. Why does the child breathe through the nose? Because it, the child it looks natural. You're better at your sports. It helps with your dental health. You know, is there a connection between children who are mouth breathing, which is causing a dry mouth, which in turn is increasing the instance of bacteria in the mouth, which in turn is contributing to dental cavities and gum disease? Mm -hmm. Children with chap lips. Do children with mouth breathing get chap lips more than nasal breathing? And of course, the answer is yes. Yes, they do, yeah. Is there a connection between mouth breathing and halitosis, bad breath? Is there a connection between mouth breathing and speech, poor speech and speech problems? Is there a connection between mouth breathing and eustachian tube? We already spoke about development. You know, so that connection is there. And I think the parents is very important. But this information is readily accessible. And, you know, that's why when I was writing the books, I always wanted to try and reference as best we can and support that the information, there is nothing new about this. This right. has been here for decades, but yet parents, it's almost as if it. it has been hidden from parents. Yeah. yeah, no one talks about it. And the other part to me that is so astounding, it's not just parents aren't talking about it. What we're finding with CAF is doctors, pediatrician, dentists, they weren't talking about it. They weren't taught it. Mm -hmm. And that's mind boggling to me personally, just something so simple. But I think that's the problem. I think, you know, there's, there's very much in medicine that if you're doing research, that you have to be doing research of what's trendy, what's cutting edge, what's at the top of the game. Very few doctors are going to tell their peers, what are you doing research on? I am researching the importance of nose breathing. They will be laughed out of the park. There is no incentive right. to do research on breathing because it's seen as so simple, so mundane. Why would you be doing anything research on that? And the other aspect of, of course, it doesn't promise profit. And that's I a was, problem too. I was about to say that's the other unfortunate thing that I have heard from other dentist that you're hearing is we're telling people don't do um braces don't pull teeth and for a lot of dentists i mean we'll just call it what it is it's their bread and butter and we're saying don't do it because it's dangerous so right it's it's definitely definitely a, a, a hot topic so with regard to breathing and and i will absolutely put we have, uh, and I'll put links in here, but we do have several of your links already on our website and our YouTube channel as references for parents. But maybe we could just do something quick that parents could do. You have a child, you have a teenager, they're stressed for a game, like we said, maybe before an exam. Maybe it's just a hard day. And what's mm. what's a, an easy exercise that maybe we could help bring them back into focus and help them regulate? There's two exercises that are pretty good for that. Now, what I would say is don't introduce the exercise when the child is stressed. Okay. In, introduce the exercise to the child when the child isn't stressed. Okay. And have the child practice it when things are going okay. Got and it. always explain to the child, if things are not going your way, this is your friend to fall back on, is your breathing. Okay. Because if you okay. control your breathing, you can have to control your mind. The first exercise is small breath holds. Take a normal breath in through the nose, out through the nose. It should be silent. So it's a normal silent breath in through the nose, a normal silent breath out through the nose. Pinch the nose and hold. Five, four, three, two, one. Let go. And just breathe now for about three, four breaths. And then again, take a normal breath in through the nose and out through the nose and pinch the nose and hold. Five, four, three, two, one. Let go. And breathe normally now for about three to four breaths. And again, take a normal breath in through the nose and out through the nose and pinch the nose and hold. Five, four, three, two, one. Let go and breathe normally for about three to four breaths. If the child does small little breath pauses, it helps to keep their breathing more regular. It helps to reduce the risk of hyperventilation. Mm, so that's okay. one way to do it. The second way is anytime, and I would say to parents actually, 
practice this yourself first. Okay. Do it when things are going well and fall back in it when things are going not so well. Anytime that we get into a difficult situation, the most important thing is not to hyperventilate. And if we start breathing hard and fast, of course, the body is telling the brain that things are not good. Right. The brain is here to protect us. And the brain will want us to get out of the situation, launch us into a fight or flight response. Whenever we get into a difficult situation, as best as you can, bring your attention onto your breathing. It might be a minute or two afterwards. You may not be able to do it there and then because the situation sometimes can take over. But after a minute or two to step back and just bring your attention onto the breath, nobody will even know that you're doing it. Take a soft breath in through your nose and have a really relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. So even though you might want to feel that you're breathing harder and faster, you might want to feel that this is the way to breathe. Always remember, if you're breathing this way, it's only going to feed into your stress response. How do you tell the brain that the body is safe? Slow down the exhalation. Okay. Take a soft breath in through the nose and a really relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. So when we have that very soft and slow, gentle breath out through the nose, we're stimulating the vagus nerve, which secretes a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which causes the heart rate to slow down. And when the heart rate is slowing down, the brain interprets that the body is safe. So the child that's about to go into an exam and their breathing is getting hard and fast and they start sighing and taking these big breaths, that is going to affect the child's ability to do well in that exam. And it has nothing got to do with the child's intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's just that the child didn't have the tools to self-regulate there. You, you say to the child, whenever you feel that your breathing is getting a little bit off, focus on slowing down the exhalation. Don't wait until the exam. Start doing it with small things first. See, the one thing about breathing is that if you bring it into your everyday life, it's there for you anyway. And things will always happen. Something happens. You could even have a, a patient who's giving out. And the patient is giving out, and they're opening and closing their mouth, and there's noise coming out of their mouth, and you have your attention on the breath. You're taking a soft breath in through the nose and a relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. You're still listening to the patient, but you're going to be remaining calm. And what you'll find now is that the patient will start calming down. You're in a better situation to deal with this, this situation. You're not going to be, you know, almost being consumed by the mood because. Of course, every now and again, people are in a bad mood and they're going to take mm -hmm. it out on somebody. And that's normal. That's human nature. Right. right. So these are the tools that we should be able to use. And we, every one of us, it's always something that'll happen. If it hasn't happened, don't worry, it soon will. Yeah, it will. And it's interesting um, because one of the things I've heard you mention, and I pulled into my daily life, um, aside from... I actually, I, I can't tell you how many times a day now I actually monitor and notice my breathing, which is funny. Somebody with an airway issue never thought about it before, but I do now. I notice it. Um, and these tools have helped me. But watching other people, you know, I was always taught to watch body language and watch their head, watch their shoulders, watch what they're doing. Never occurred to me, watch their breathing. And I heard you say this, I think it was in a TED talk one time. Wow. And I'm noticing now when I engage with people, I do watch for that. And especially even with my children, because such a subtle nuance, child looks just fine. And I started watching her breathing and I'm thinking, wow, she's a heavy breathing moment right here. Something's going on and it's nose breathing. Mm -hmm. But had I not been attuned to it, completely would have missed it mm. so um just another great tip for parents you know as you're thinking something so simple watch their breathing yeah. patterns watch what they're doing when they're awake because even if they look okay you know and this yes. is an example i'm thinking of my child was in fight or flight she was in complete freak out mode and i had i would have there was no other way i would have known it yeah yeah and it can be a very important tool because kids now you know, they spend a lot of time on social media, they spend a lot of time on mobile phones. We we will not always know what's going on there. That's just the way no, it no. is. No, no. So typically at the end of a podcast, I like to completely turn the floor back over to our guest for 
final thoughts, be it for parents or medical professionals or both. So I, I would like to give that, give the floor totally over to you now. You know, I think the most important thing is for the individual to be informed and to do your own digging on this one. Um, there's questions that are unanswered. Mm-hmm. And we, but we still have to ask the common sense of it all and the logic of it. You know, I think the more we observe, and the interesting thing from the medical health point of view is most medical professionals who were into airway, when I actually asked them what brought you into this, they came across it because when they were working with their own children. Mm-hmm. And that's a very interesting one. You know, they're working with their patients, but they don't see their patients when the patient goes home. Right. When you're working with your child, you're seeing the child during, of course, the treatment, but you're also seeing the child during sleep, during their normal every day. Mm-hmm. And this is when then some people will just ask the question, just something is off here. And breathing could be very that one thing. I'm not going to say it's a cure all, not at all, but it is a fundamental function that influences all of the major disciplines of medicine. 75% of individuals with panic disorder and anxiety have dysfunctional breathing, 75%. Now, we could say that it's the anxiety and the panic that's causing breathing to be faster and harder and upper chest and irregular, but we also have to realize that that faster and harder and upper chest breathing is feeding back into the stress response. Mm-hmm. So we we do have those tools. And I think it starts with us. Like it starts with me. It starts with you. It starts with the person listening. You bring it into your own way of life. If I'm on the treadmill behind me here, I will do it with breathing in and out through the nose. When I'm asleep, my mouth is closed. If I get into a difficult situation as best I can, I bring my attention onto my breath. I slow down the exhalation. I do breath holding during the day. I take my attention out of the mind And I connect with my breath with many, many times throughout the day. And it's a tremendous capacity to help to bring a stillness to the mind, a quietness to the mind, but also a connection with everything that's going on around you. And ultimately, it helps with energy levels, concentration, creativity, intuition, and above all else, happiness. Because I remember when I was that kid, even into my early 20s, and Having spent 16 years in formal education, I come out of it not knowing how to concentrate. I come out of it not knowing how to regulate states. I come out of it not knowing how to deal with the stress and the challenges of when you first go into the workforce. So it didn't teach me the very tools that I needed to learn to be able to go out there in society. And I was very stressed in my early 20s in the workforce. And it wasn't necessarily the company that was causing it. But it was my physiology, because Mm. ultimately our resilience and our ability to cope with the daily, you know, ups and downs of life. You know, anybody listening to this will identify with this. You know, something happens. One person can take it in their stride and the other pair's person. It's a it's a total drama that consumes the individual. Mm -hmm. So stuff happens. Do we want to be at the mercy of every small little situation that happens because all that's doing is going to throw us into a state of chaos. Mm -hmm. So life is a bit softer when you have a connection with your breath because you can regulate your states and your breathing is also influencing your sleep. Your sleep is influencing your emotions. Your emotions are influencing your breathing. Your emotions are influencing your sleep your breathing influences your sleep as well. Like, so there's a three-way connection there. You can't disentangle the emotions from sleep and breathing. One is feeding into the other. So there's that bi-directional relationship always there. Start with the breath. Even just start breathing through your nose during rest, during physical exercise. Never wake up with a dry mouth in the morning. I just came across an article there about three days ago that... Adults who wake up with a dry mouth are at a greater risk of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. We have been talking about this for 20 years. Mm -hmm. This was the first paper that I've seen it being studied. If you have a dry mouth in the morning, you're at a greater risk of snoring and sleep apnea. The very fact that the dry mouth is mouth breathing. It's mouth breathing that's increasing the risk of snoring and sleep apnea. 
and to dry mouth as the result of that. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a sign. That's it. It is. Well, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come on and speak with me today. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much, Rebecca.